I was on my show about four or six months ago now, and again, basically, as soon as the show finished, I got loads of emails saying, get this guy out of talk, we need, we need more from him. Um, the information that this chap is about to give you, when you consider that we're subjected to all this chemical treatments, um, you know, painkillers and this and that for everything that you get to for your doctors and then you listen to Clive and he comes out with all these different types of remedies that help us that are non-intrusive, it just blows you away. So a lot of research that this chap is doing is going to be putting to us today. The talk, Clive explains what they uh, didn't teach you at school, essential facts like how uh, to have the ideal weight loss, reversing vision loss, the end of tooth decay, restoring the immune system, ending allergies and much more. So guys, massive round of applause for Clive DeCarl. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'll start with a story that I wouldn't normally tell, except that we've had all these um, uh, interesting stories about uh, UFOs and so on. Uh, when I was 11, I got taken on a small boat, a um, little dinghy, and it was in incredibly clear water, so you could really see what was going on, and we had a bucket with a glass bottom on, on it. So you could put the bucket with the glass bottom in, in the water, and you could see everything crystal clear. And I'd never been fishing before, but um, I was taken, this was on a, on a fishing trip, and the person I was with, they held the fishing rod, and within seconds, it was in the Caribbean, so within seconds, about 20 fish were attracted to the, um, uh, to the bait. And he was catching them every two or three minutes, catching a fish. He then passed the rod to me. The moment I touched the fishing rod, all the fish, who were quite in a frenzy, suddenly slowed their pace right down and just wandered off. He touched the fishing rod, all the fish came back. I touched it again, they all went away. And I realized that these fish were reading my mind because he really wanted to go fishing and was really looking forward to eating the fish. I, on the other hand, I already had a tremendous battle with myself to impale the worm on the hook. It, that was really difficult for me. And I, the idea of having to extract a hook from the mouth of a fish was something I was dreading. And it was weird because the fish were picking right up on that. They wouldn't have anything to do with me. Anyway, um, a little while later, uh, when I was about 15, um, I found myself floating on the ceiling, and this was an extraordinary experience because I hadn't done that before, and there was a, like a microsecond where my O-levels just went into insignificance, and here I am floating on the ceiling looking down at my dead body, and it's, it's in a very weird shape, and I'm really, I, I have this instant realisation that, that I, am, I am not my body because I'm just me, and that, I'm just the same as I was there, except I haven't got a worry in the world, I'm feeling absolutely great and I'm floating on the ceiling. Anyway, I'm just really getting into it, uh, when suddenly, bam, I'm back in my body and I come back to life again. And it was sort of a bit annoying, really. Um, anyway, uh, in my early 20s, I studied with a sort of an esoteric society, and they taught me all sorts of things, including how to do hands-off healing, and how to see auras and etherics and all this stuff. And I never did anything with it at all. Um, I went into various businesses. The main one was ophthalmic optics. And I got to see firsthand um, the inside of uh, operating theatres. And I uh, used to sit in on, on neurosurgery, actually, and uh, watch people have uh, um, incredible things done by incredible surgeons, who I have to say, I, I, I saw genius at work, absolute genius. You know, if there are certain parts of the medical profession who are incredible. If, if you, you've been in an accident, you've been in an emergency, what they can do to fix you is absolutely amazing. They know, for instance, in the uh, emergency room, they know medicine, they don't seem to teach the others. They understand that, let's say, four people come in having a heart attack or a stroke, a good emergency room doctor will know that if you inject them uh, with um, magnesium chloride, Chances are, instead of all four dying, only three are going to die. Now, that's, I was, only one is going to die. Sorry, only one of four is going to die. Magnesium chloride. But um, I spoke, for instance, to uh, a young uh, doctor who was just taking their exams in four weeks' time, the final exams. I said, tell me what you know about magnesium. And uh, she looked at me and she said, well, I don't really know anything about magnesium, which is a great shame. 
Um, let me tell you what they perhaps could have taught her, and what the emergency room doctor knows. Um, magnesium is the uh, mineral that allows your muscles to relax. Calcium is the stuff that makes them <coughs> contract. Magnesium allows them to relax. Now, um, some of you will probably be getting little muscular issues. Could, could I ask you perhaps to put up your hands anybody who's getting twitches around the eyes or muscle cramps? Okay. Uh, 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 anybody on top of that who is getting hiccups, that's another sign of um, uh, a, a deficiency of magnesium. Now, if you're getting a muscle cramp, this is really serious because if you had a muscle cramp of your heart, you know, we, we call that a heart attack. You don't want one of those. They're, they're just not good. And so they don't teach <coughs> doctors about magnesium and having a role with hearts. They don't teach it. Um, people with arrhythmias, uh, they are also deficient in magnesium. Um, now, magnesium is perhaps the most important of all the minerals because it makes all the other things work properly. You know, without magnesium, you can't absorb the vitamins properly. Most of the other minerals won't work. And unfortunately, magnesium is missing from lots of the foods. The moment you take a brown food, let's say brown rice, whole, whole grain wheat or whatever, and you take the brown bit out, now you're left with the white rice or the white flour, lots of the magnesium and most of the other minerals are actually gone and it's a real problem because they've taken magnesium out of everything you know I used to think that sea salt was good stuff now 27 years ago or something I got incredibly ill and the doctors said you're type 1 diabetic now so you can't have any more salt you've got to really cut down on that and for the next 10 years I had horrible leg cramps until somebody told me well you realize you're not eating enough salt and I started eating more salt and the leg cramps went away. Now, at that point, um, you know, any of you who are eating table salt, you know, that free-running table salt, just ditch that, use it to defrost the, the pavement or something, but whatever you do, don't eat it, because it's highly refined. So what we think of as a natural salt is sea salt. So let's say you go into your favorite supermarket, you walk into a supermarket like Deathco, and you buy death codes, you buy that, sorry, I, I've got a list, I can't say it. Um, you walk into death codes, uh, salt department, and there you'll, you'll see salt, and you know, fa famous names, and they're dry and fluffy and white. Now, that's not sea salt. Uh, that's highly refined sea salt, because sea salt is grey and wet. If you pop down to your nearest ocean, dehydrate, let's say, some Atlantic, um, what you've got is something grey and wet because it's so full of magnesium, salt from the sea, that and magnesium attracts water to it, so it'll never dry out. Let's say you, 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 you've dried out your, your sea you know, in the wind and the, and the sun on those sort of salt flats. You've got it, let's say you put it down in the oven, you heat it up, and now it really is dry. Leave it at room temperature. Uh, just out in the room, and moisture from the air will rehydrate that salt, so it's always wet. So Deathco don't think you want grey wet salt, so they um, kindly remove the, the wetness, i.e. the magnesium, and remove lots of the, the, the greyness, and you're left with a salt that really just isn't, isn't the, the real deal. It's got maybe a fraction of what, uh, what it should have. Similarly, Himalayan pink salt um, you'd think that that was a healthy salt, but in actual fact what's happened is over the millennia water, rain, has just washed the more soluble minerals out of the pink salt, so it's dry, so there's no magnesium in it. And I saw a mineral assay of a pink salt, and there were basically only 13 minerals essentially left in it. I was really, really surprised by that. Now, what happens if you don't have enough salt is really, really serious. If you don't have enough salt, you can't make stomach acid. And if you can't make stomach acid, you're going to have a whole host of problems. And if you go to the GP, he's going to say, well, uh, you need an, an, an antacid, an anti-acid. He, he, they would try and say that um, if you've got uh, acid reflux, for instance, which is uh, a problem brought about by non, eat, not eating enough salt often, They'll say you've got too much acid, where in actual fact the opposite is true. Um, let's start with the stomach, because it, it's so important. 
as you get older, you make less of things. You make less enzymes, you have less strength, you have less of things as you get older, except hopefully knowledge, which you hopefully have more of. But um, the doctors seem to think you make more stomach acid as you get older, which is contrary to what we know is true. So let's say you do the opposite of what the doctor says. Instead of taking an antacid, you take something like, um, well, some nice uh, proper sea salt would be good. And there's a code name for the real salt. It's called Celtic salt. That's, that's how you tell. And um, so let's say now you're eating more salt, and you, you eat an extract from the beetroot called betaine. Now, um, if you take betaine, that is the precursor for hydrochloric acid. So now with salt and betaine, suddenly your stomach's going to be working properly again. And it won't take long until acid reflux has probably gone away. And now if you're eating salt, salt also provides the mechanism to make the thing that happens after the stomach. Uh, it then goes alkaline and uh, your body makes bicarbonate of soda as the next action after leaving the acidity of the stomach. And to make bicarbonate soda, you also need salt. So they've been telling us to eat less salt. And they have been, uh, unfortunately, um, not doing us any favours by suggesting that. Um, um, some of you may have heard of Dr. Batman Jellig, who was arrested in uh, Iran 20-odd uh, years ago when the Ayatollah came to power. And they were arresting so many people that he got put into a jail that I think was built for, for 800 and there was 7,000 in there or something like that. And something like half the population was ill and he was pretty much the only doctor and there were no medicines. The only thing he had to give all these ill people, and most of them had stomach issues from the food, was they did have very good water there and they also had real salt, uh, this type of grey wet salt that I was talking about. So as he had nothing else, he said to, to everybody who came to him, drink as much water as you can, eat loads of salt. So 15 months later, they come to him and say, well, we're really sorry, we made a mistake, you can go. And he says, uh, well, actually, I'm doing the biggest experiment of my entire career. Do you mind if I stay in prison for another six months? He stays in prison for another six months. And he wrote a book called The Body's Many Cries for Water. And you go, go on to his website, and there are literally thousands of people who said, you're absolutely right, my high blood pressure, or whatever it was, it was just lack of water, and I wasn't eating enough salt. Uh, I'm not saying that salt and water are the cure for all high blood pressure, but uh, it's surprising what salt and water can achieve. Most of us are dehydrated. The scientists say if you're 1% dehydrated, you can tell in an IQ test. They reckon that most of us are 10% dehydrated, 20% dehydrated in certain cases. So how much access to your brain have you got if you're 10 or 20% dehydrated? You know, are you only 80% here? You know, we are mainly water, and uh, it's pretty important stuff. So the type of water you're putting into your body is going to determine the type of cells and the type of brain that you're going to have. Now, let's say your car was dirty and you wanted to wash it. Well, you wouldn't want to wash your car in Coca-Cola or coffee or tea or something like that. You'd want to wash it in water. Now, your cells are expecting to be washed in water all the time. You, you know, your default is to be happy and to drink water. Now, if you don't drink some pure water every now and then, those cells are going to be a bit clogged up. And um, I can show you a little um, demonstration, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, you want to make sure that the Paul, oh, could you do me a favour? Could you grab a tea bag out of that box? Uh, you want to make sure that your cells are. Do you sure? Sure. I can do that. Sure. That's <laughs> so, um, if I put this tea bag in a glass of water, right? It's cold water, so so not much is going to happen. But there are things you can do to change water. You can change uh, various aspects of water. You can change the um, electrical charge of it, um, you can change the surface tension of the water. Now, uh, th these are some minerals, just some simple minerals uh, from the soil, plant-based minerals. And the moment you uh, add uh, a way of, of getting the, uh, the stuff out, 
uh, you can see how, how, what, how much has been drawn out of the tea bag by adding <coughs> minerals. Now, um, you want to add minerals to you because if you add the right type of minerals, all the toxins that have built up over, over your entire life in your cells can be cleaned. Um, there are natural mineral products that literally go into your cells, hydrate them, now, now they're absorbing more oxygen, and they exchange the good guys for the bad guys, and it's about the electrical charge. And I'm going to talk a bit more about the electrical charge of our bodies and why this is absolutely vital to health to know about your electrical charge. We're ele electrical beings. But I want to just get back uh, to the stomach and uh, eating food. Now, we've been told about you know the healthy food triangle, that we should have a basis of uh, whole grain carbohydrates and stuff like that. But uh, what I've noticed is that probably the most addictive of the uh, products isn't heroin or all the drugs, but probably wheat. Um, many of us, unless we've paid attention to it, are finding that we start our addiction in the morning with a wheat product. Then at uh, midday we, or, or mid-morning we have a little a wheat product, followed by lunchtime where we have a sandwich or a wheat product, and at tea time we have a wheat product, and maybe um, uh, we have some pasta or pizza at, at, in the evening. A lot of people are absolutely addicted to it. An addiction is something that you do really often. It's something you look forward to in advance of it happening. It's something that makes you feel really good while, it, while it's happened and it keeps, keeps you feeling happy a little bit afterwards. And carbohydrates, but the grains in particular, are nothing like the ones that our ancestors would have known some time ago. You know, in Roman times, wheat was sort of 12 foot, 14 foot high, and now it's been bred to be two foot high because, you know, why, why, pick it, why wait for it to get that high? They, they bred it very differently. Um, when I was young, food was different. Um, for instance, cucumbers were a sort of curvy shape, and they had viable seeds that, that if you preserved them, you could sit, grow them and uh, uh, grow new cucumber plants. But now we're fed lots of seedless vegetables, lots of seedless varieties. And those seedless varieties are so weak, they can't, they can't even reproduce. And we're expected to believe that we're going to get the nutrient goodness from a seedless grape as opposed to a big, powerful, proper grape with very, very big seeds in no way. So not only are we uh, being given food that's been, been poisoned in various ways, but uh, they've changed the nature of food big time. Now, um, uh, some years ago, I decided to um, stop everything and start an organic farm. And um, the first thing that struck me when I, uh, this was in Spain, and the first thing that struck me when I arrived there was that uh, all the trees that were growing there, fruit trees and so on, every single one was different. And I was so used to the English way where all the apples in the field all taste the same because they're all hybrids, but there, everyone was different. And, and the guy who was, was looking after the farm with me told me, oh, well, that's a really good tree, that was, a, that was awful, that's a really good tree. And it became very clear that there were various things going on. There was the genetics of each type of tree, and, and, and it's very important that, that we try and get hold of some old varieties for, for our future and plant them. But it was also very clear that there were differences depending on, from one field to another, that the strata of minerals seemed to vary in very small areas. You know, and most farmers, you ask them, you know, which are your good fields? They'll say, well, that, that's a good field, that's a good field, that part of that field's a really good field. And so the, the minerals are very different depending on where you are in the world. And because of modern farming techniques, obviously, the minerals that used to be in the soil aren't there. Let me give you an example. The country supposedly with the highest rate of arthritis in the world is Jamaica. The country with the lowest rate of arthritis in the world is Israel. The country with the lowest boron in the soil is Jamaica. The country with the highest boron in the soil is Israel. Now, I used to do business with the Israelis at one point. And I used to ask them, every time some, one of them would ring up, I'd say, do you know anybody who's got arthritis? And you, know, you ask that of an English person, do you know anybody who's got arthritis? Or everybody's going to say yes. Most of them would say, well, I can't think of anybody. That's because it hardly occurs. Could there be a link with the mineral boron, I wonder? Um, so the problem is we're eating food where the minerals have, have been stripped from the soil. So. Um, 
we're eating very, very empty food, and it's very, very necessary to correct this. And I found this out uh, the hard way 27 years ago when I got ill. I was fit, played a bit of basketball, did all sorts of stuff, and then suddenly I was having real problems walking. And then it was too much for me to do the power steering of the car, then it got too much for me to go to work at all. Then one morning I realised I couldn't put my socks on. It was too, I couldn't, didn't have the strength to put my socks on. It was that, that time they put me into hospital. And they shoved me in there for about three weeks, and at the end they said, well, we don't know what's wrong, uh, we don't know how to cure it, but we can operate this afternoon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just didn't sound right. So I got taken out of there, and I got taken to Patrick Holford, who's now written about 22 book books. And Patrick Holford said, look, you don't need the drugs, you don't need the surgery, you need some minerals. And he gave me a huge bundle of minerals and vitamins, and he was absolutely 100% right. And I had arthritis so badly I looked like I was 85 years old. I, I was a, a real mess, you know, heart, knobbly bits all over the place. And uh, it took about a year or so, but it all went away. Every single knobbly bit went away, and I was fine. And um, I realised that the doctors said, uh, Mr. Trick, they just haven't, because uh, they, they, they they're not taught health. You know, we go to doctors thinking that, that they know about health, but it's not a subject they study. They have no idea. They don't. They, they don't know. Uh, they, they, you know, if you if you want uh, surgery, radiation, and drugs, go to a doctor. They're brilliant at that. Or if you've got an emergency, you know, go to the emergency room. They're brilliant at that. Um, so uh, anyway, shortly after that, a couple of years later, my dad's best friend told me that uh, he'd got cancer for the second time, and he he, he said he, he'd never survive if we went through. Uh, the medical profession again, he felt. So um, he finds Linus Pauling, the sort of father of vitamin C, you might say, in the phone book, rings him up, and Linus Pauling says, take 25 grams of vitamin C a day, and that should sort your cancer out, and you know, with the proviso you build up slowly. So he follows Linus Pauling's advice, and he's the only person on the planet who ever won the Nobel Prize as one person twice. And um, He's on his way to the doctor's office for what he fears might be like the last checkup, but because he hasn't been taking the chemotherapy, he's still strong and fit. And uh, so he's, he's in New York, he's walking to the doctor's office when six guys mug him. And thinking that he's got nothing left to lose, and being a powerful guy, he takes on all six of them. And they run away, and he gets to keep the money. And he gets to the doctor's office, and the doctor says, well, I don't know what you've been doing, but uh, the cancer's gone. And he only died a couple of years ago. He lived about 25 years uh, afterwards and didn't die of cancer. Now, so I had two things in my, my, own, my own recovery and his to say, well, actually, hang on. So uh, at that point, I had to go back to work within you know, what I was doing. Uh, but when I uh, stopped and did the organic farming, one of the first person I met was... Um, this chap who'd retired, and he was a doctor, and he explained to me that he used to be the chief surgeon of Ireland, and that whenever possible, he'd do his surgery using hypnosis rather than anesthesia. You know, he said to me, look, choose your anaesthetist. It's far more important than the surgeon, because it's the anaesthetist that, that's going to kill you or keep you alive. And he said he, he doesn't like any anaesthetic because you know, there's, there's a risk, there's a percentage risk factor. So he said, look, I, I just use hypnosis, he said. I put them into a deep hypnosis, and then if I want to test my work, see whether I've reconnected their fingers right or something, I, I can quickly get them out of hypnosis, say, wiggle your fingers and put them back again, whereas to get wait for the anaesthetic to wear off, well, that wouldn't have been possible. So I got quite impressed with that, and then probably forgot all about it, until I was around at a friend's house, and there's a picture of my friend, and he had this knitting needle through his arm, and there was somebody else also had a knitting needle through their arm, and they're both smiling. <laughs> And I said, what, what is that picture about? He said, oh, we, we, we went to this hypnosis class. It was, a, it was a weekend course, and by one o'clock on the Saturday, we were already sticking needles through our arms. And uh, he, he explained, look, what, what we did is we basically uh, we gave ourselves a hypnotic command that there'd be no bleeding, no pain, uh, no bruising, no infection. And he said, the one, th one thing I wish, I wish I'd given myself as a command was not to feel anything. He said... I, I said, I, he said, I don't want to feel pain, but he said, I hadn't turned off feeling 
in general. So he said he felt it going through every muscle and sinew as it, as it went through, but it didn't hurt. And then you could take it out and you could look right through because you'd stop bleeding. And I said, okay, I want to meet this guy. He said, well, it's Mervyn. And it's, you, can, you can meet Mervyn. So uh, I, at that point, I was sort of loosely working with a medical doctor. And uh, so the two of us rented Mervyn for the weekend and we said, teach us self-hypnosis. And um, the first time I tested it out on myself, what well, this was bef this was years ago before I'd discovered that um, my migraines, which I was getting at the time, uh, were to do with dehydration. I hadn't worked out that I was dehydrated and getting migraines. Anyway, I had a terrible migraine. I knew from experience I'd just have to go in a dark room and feel sorry for myself for many hours. And I suddenly remembered I could do self-hypnosis, and I hadn't tried it before. So I went through this 30-second self-hypnosis, and boom, the pain stopped, 100%, and I couldn't believe it. You know, how did I do that? I mean, I, the pain stopped. And I'd put in the safety clause, which you have to put in when you're doing work like this, which is I put a time limit on it. I said, I want to be free of pain for two hours. So I was looking at my watch, thinking, well, you know, two hours is up. But the pain didn't come back after two hours. Because obviously, you've got to put a time period in it. Because if I said I don't want to feel pain, and I hadn't put a time limit on it, then I might have bashed my head, not feel, felt the pain, and bled to death. So, you know, pain's an important thing. Anyway, about three weeks later, I got dehydrated again, had another migraine, thought, aha, yeah, easy, ha, me, I can do anything. And so I went through the same procedure, didn't bloody work. And uh, so I went back to Mervyn and said, why, why didn't it work? He said, oh, well, your subconscious has learnt the fact that you know how to do hypnosis now. It's not going to let you do that again, because if you'd said, um, I want to turn my heart off now, it would have done. And so it's not going to let you, you know, you're going to be cleverer if you want to get into that deep level so easily next time. But I did get a pretty good insight that, wow, if we can just turn off pain like, just like that, what can we do? So I started going on courses, uh, learning hypnosis. And um, it was very, very interesting because um, I learned a few really fantastic keys, which I'll tell you a couple. Um, you know, one of the keys of hypnosis is always to talk in the positive uh, because um, the reason people fail when they try to give up smoking is the very fact that nobody wants to give up anything. What the smokers want is they want to be free from it. Now your subconscious can understand the idea of being free from something but it hates and loathes the fact of giving up anything. So the language that you use with, with hypnosis is really, really important. That's why, you know, I mean, obviously we all hate to be criticised. So if, if you say to somebody, you, if you criticise them, they hate it and a wall's gone up. Uh, if, you, if you want to um, uh, get anywhere with, with somebody, you, you, you really want to praise them. And uh, to say to the person that you love, I love you so much when, when you do it like that and let them know what you want and not what you don't want. Um, but it's very, it, was, it was very interesting because one of the first things I realized that there is a, a ten, 10 minute technique which can unwind most people's problems. So that if you can put, let, let's say somebody had problems as a child, um, if you can put that problem in, into a short picture, like, like a ten, if you can make a 10 second movie about how you were abused or whatever it was, then um, if you have the capability to do that, and you can put several events all into one bracket, uh, one can literally <coughs> unwind uh, a problem. And, and if you want, at, at the end, uh, I, I can show you how to, how to do that, because it's a useful technique uh, to learn. Um, OK, I got a bit uh, uh, digressed with that. Uh, what I'd like to do is pass around a little bit of real salt, in case any of you haven't had proper dehydrated ocean. Um, could you take that sure. and put it, um, uh, if, uh, if you just tip a bit out to there and, and let, let people take a look. Take it. If you all eat, tr tr try eating just a little one grain of salt, because if you haven't had real dehydrated ocean, it does taste completely different to ordinary salt. And this thing about salt is dangerous, it's bad for your heart, you'll get high blood pressure. This is true if it's sodium chloride, if it's table salt. Uh, it's going it's to mess you up. If, it, if it's a salt that's not whole, 
it's not whole. Real dehydrated ocean, uh, people with low blood pressure, often their blood pressure goes up to, towards normal. People with high blood, blood pressure often goes down towards normal. But the interesting thing is that I've been studying um, uh, um, deaths. Uh, who dies of what and what have they done? It turns out that the people with blood pressure, the, the, um, the, at 120 over 90 or 120 over 80 is what, what the doctors say your blood pressure should be. But in actual fact, um, when you look at the figures as to who survives heart attacks, what, what blood pressure do the, do the survivors have is the ones that have uh, the higher number of 165 and over, not 120 or less, 165 or over that survive heart attacks best. Now, doctors assume that all of you are going to have the same blood pressure. You could be four foot three, and I could pick you up in one hand, or you could be a sumo wrestler. It's assumed that you have the same blood pressure. How can this be? Because if you have an, an extra uh, pound of weight on you, you need about an extra 20 miles of blood vessels to service that extra pound of you. So the bigger you get, the, more, the harder that the brain, uh, sorry, the harder the heart has to work to pump the blood round because you need a good supply of blood everywhere, particularly to your brain. So if you, as you get bigger, uh, you need higher blood pressure, otherwise you're gonna have real problems. But the doctors don't seem to take this into account and um, so what I recommend everybody to do is to actually start to research yourself. If any of you have got any sort of health problem, there are two magic words, because Google has got the answers to most health, most health problems on page one. If you put in your problem, say tonsillitis, and the magic words, natural cure, I, I would say that right now, with a lovely free internet, it's all there. The answer to every disease, no matter what it is, is on page one of Google. There are, it, it's there. Um, now, uh, one, of the, one of the things I've been looking at is how they've been fooling us. Uh, because um, when you read the papers and you uh, see the media one way or another, you see this kind of stuff, right? Statins are the key to long life. Okay? Now, if I very quickly just dissect this so, so you can see what's really going on, it says heart pills and exercise will save millions of lives. Yeah, that, that number, millions of lives. Okay, let me just read it very quickly. Wonder heart pills and regular exercise are the magic combination to, keep, to help millions live longer, say scientists. Keeping fit and active in old age or taking cholesterol-busting statins are both vital for preventing early death. And when the two are combined, it dramatically slashes the chances of dying early by up to 70%, scientists found, after a 10-year study of 10,000 people. So, sounds good so far, okay? Um, slashes the chance of dying by 70%, 10-year study, 10,000 people, that, that's, that's fairly good. Experts are already calling for everyone over the age of 50 to be, to be prescribed statins to ward off chronic and potentially fatal conditions, even if the patients are at low risk. They say administering statins to an extra 5 million people would cut heart attacks and strokes by 10,000 a year and save at least 2,000 lives. Well, hang on. Here it's going to save millions of lives. And by, page, by, by the next page, uh, it's already down to 2,000. Where, where did the other 999,000, etc. go? Um, the pills, which cost as little as 40p a day, are taken by 8 million Britons to reduce cholesterol, etc. Now, 8 million of us are apparently taking them already. Now, bearing in mind they're only given to you if you're over 55, I think, that's an awful lot of the old people who are taking statins. And uh, now, uh, uh, let me tell you what the boss of the trial, it said, leader of the study, Dr. Peter Kokinas of the Veterinary Affairs Medical Center in Washington said, unfit and middle-aged and older people would only need to undertake moderate and feasible activity such as walking or gardening to achieve greater protection than achieved by statins. So the leader of the study is saying that some feasible gardening or walking is going to give you better, better benefit than the statins. So why are we paying 40p 
a pill for something that we could get by a little bit of walking. But it's all right, because we're not paying £1.40. Further down in a separate article, presumably written by another journalist, is NHS gets £1.40 wonder drug, a heart pill costing £1.40 a day that could save thousands of lives every year, and, and they've approved it. They haven't, they haven't bothered with the 40p one on the front page, they've gone with the £1.40 <laughs> one. I suppose you'd be pleased to know. Um, um, now, uh, but there's something else. Uh, US scientists studied 10,000 men and women with an average age of 60 and diagnosed with the high cholesterol condition dyslipidemia. Now, just out of interest, have any of you got dyslipidemia? Have any of you heard of dyslipidemia? Right, it, 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 uh, that's a bit of a trick question because it is to do with high cholesterol. But uh, they said at the beginning, you may have noticed, that they tested it on 10,000 people for 10 years. But they didn't tell you that they all had dyslipidemia, a, a thing apparently none of you in the room have ever heard of. So is it applicable to you, that this, this figure of 10,000 people? And where are the millions of people dying? Anyway, uh, I could go on taking this, to sh cutting this to shreds. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's on the front page of the newspapers. Everybody is going to pretty much believe it, unless you're really looking for the flaws in it. So let me point out an another way they did it. There was a, a very interesting cancer study, uh, which claimed it was the Macmillan Cancer Study. You may, may, you've probably heard about it, where they said that early diagnosis of breast cancer can mean that you can live, that women can live six years longer. And late diagnosis it, uh, means that, you know, whatever. So, uh, this is how they did it. They, they took one woman, now she was lucky, she had an early diagnosis, uh, in, uh, uh, it had only, only been one year, and so she got diagnosed early. Now she lived another six years, and she died on this date here. Now, so they probably did all the things they do with breast cancer in those six years it deteriorated and she finally died. Now there's woman number two. She didn't go for early diagnosis, so she lived the first six years in blissful ignorance, knowing that she didn't have breast cancer, and it was diagnosed late. Oh no, she only lived one year. But both of them got the cancer on the same day, and they both died on the same day, but the lucky one who got diagnosed early, she lived six years longer. <laughs> okay, get, get the trick? That's how they did it. And... Um, they, they do it other ways. Um, you know, uh, let, let's say we, we want to work out who of us is going to die of a heart attack. Right? So uh, th there are the absolute risk figures. There, there, there's the absolute risk that, let's say, 20% of us are likely uh, to die of a heart attack, or we would have been until we got the information about the magnesium and other things I'm going to tell you. But um, now, so, so that would be an absolute risk. You know. Uh, let's, let's say uh, one in 20, uh, one in five of us. Now, a relative risk would be of all, of all of us. Let's say one of us um, liked uh, eating a pineapple pizza, and uh, none of the rest of us did. But that one person, uh, no, I'm not describing this properly. Sorry. Um, uh, an absolute risk would would be let's say that that one of you. Uh, doesn't get the disease and they eat pineapple pizza and all the rest of you don't. Uh, I'm not describing this properly. Um, my apologies. Uh, basically, they compare... Uh, I'm, I'm going to just stop that one and start, start again. <laughs> my, my apologies. All of the uh, whenever, you, whenever you read that, um, when they give you a number, a percentage, you know, a 30% chance of you getting better if you take this drug, just look to see whether they say it's an absolute risk or a relative risk, because they lie, and they use relative risks. There may be a one in a thousandth chance, but in terms of relative risks, they can play with those numbers, and it can uh, uh, turn out to be uh, 50 percent. Um, I'm not going to explain it because I'm not doing it well. Uh, let's get back to the stomach, which is where we were before. Now, on your way down, it goes, uh, the food goes right the way through your gut. Now, um, if you have ever taken a drug from the doctor, particularly the antidepressants, even more so the antibiotics, you will have damaged the natural inhabitants of your gut. 
Now they say that there we are beings with perhaps a hundred trillion cells. There are ten times that many bacteria in your gut. So we think of ourselves as us, but actually uh, as, as a whole body we are highly outnumbered. And so if you're drinking water with chlorine in it, or fluoride in it, uh, you're going to be decimating the internal flora of your gut. And they say that 85% of your immune system is generated in the gut. And it's not food that gets you well, it's not the minerals and vitamins that get you well, really it's your immune system that gets you well. All those other things allow your immune system the capability to work properly, you know, because we are self-repairing mechanisms. We are normally uh, in perfect health. If we lose our health, there are only really two reasons why that would happen. One reason is that we've become poisoned. Some toxin has got into our body, and so we are not operating properly because that toxin is stopping our meta metabolism functioning correctly. The other reason is that we have a nutrient deficiency. So if you correct those two things, if you make sure that all of you are getting all the nutrients you need, every single one, and you've got the toxins out, then you should be healthy. That should mean you don't have disease. Because if you just keep focusing on health, then all the diseases should drop away. And so one of the important things to, to do, therefore, is to correct the flora in your immune system. And you can do that very, very quickly. Now, when this damage gets done, the bully of the situation is, is uh, the yeast candida. I can almost guarantee that most of you have got a yeast infection. A lot of you will know about it. Some of you might have fungal toenails. A lot of you will know. If you're unsure, you can do a test. When you wake up tomorrow morning, before you even take a glass, of, a gl sip of water, spit into a glass of water and leave it for one hour. At the end of one hour, if the spit has floated to the bottom, sunk to the bottom, that's candida. If you're seeing strands coming down from top to bottom, that's candida. If one hour later the spit's still floating on the top, like it was originally, you haven't got candida. Now, if you have got candida, this is what to do understand that just, just like cancer eats uh, sugar and fruit, sweet things, candida thrives on sugar and sweet things. So it would be a wise idea to stop eating uh, a lot of fruit, stop eating anything sweet and cut carbohydrates out for, for a little, little time. The other thing to do is to take another yeast which is called Saccharomyces boulardii and this is a, an incredible uh, yeast because what it does is it, it attacks the outside membrane of candida. So if you take Saccharomyces boulardii and then three hours later, well, it wipes out the, a lot of the candida. Now you've got literally gaps in your gut where the candida used to be. So three hours later you take a really powerful regular probiotic and that fills the gaps. And so if you take uh, the Saccharomyces for about 10 days, ideally three times a day, followed three hours afterwards each time with uh, the good probiotics, it's the best thing I've seen yet to, to uh, beat candida. But you need full nutrition to, to beat anything. And I'd like to run through what some of, that, some of those are. <coughs> um, so the first thing is you really need to get your uh, immune system back together again. Now, I don't like buying probiotics because they cost money, and I'm all for making it yourself at home if, if you possibly can. So how I make my own probiotics at home is I, is I ferment vegetables. And it's so simple, and we as people have sort of lost the art. Let me just remind you what the art is, because it's very simple. Let's say you wanted to pickle onions. Now, most people think that pickling onions involves some sort of alchemy where you pour vinegar on, onto them and leave them in a dark cupboard. But that's not how you make pickled onions. How you make pickled onions is you get a jar, you get some water, you hold the onions under the water, and they start pickling. Even within a day or two, they'll start tasting pickly. And all you have to do is keep them under water. If a bit of onion popped out up above the water, it's going to go mouldy. 
you can just throw that bit away. This is like jam. You, you, get, you can get mold growing on the top, but it's not underneath. You just cut. But if you hold vegetables underneath, they will ferment. Now, the reason people add salt, usually, to, to the water is that the salt keeps the bad bacteria at bay uh, until such time. So after a few days, the good bacteria are now happily fermenting your vegetables, and they keep the bad bacteria out. But it's worth putting salt in the water. So you don't have to just use onions. You could, you could use any vegetables. And what I do uh, myself at home is I cut up lots of the hard vegetables. I use things like sweet potato, garlic, chili, onion, uh, red cabbage, um, beetroot, raw beetroot, celery. Uh, you can use anything, absolutely anything. The smaller you chop it up, the quicker it um, ferments. So uh, a typical way to do it is you get a, a wide, wide mouth jar and you chop up all your vegetables, put them in, cover it with, with salted water, and then let's say you could put a saucer on top if, if it fitted with a weight on top just so that you any way you can to make sure that all the vegetables are underneath the water. And you'd be surprised how, how nice it tastes uh, in a few days. After about five days, so you just leave it in a dark place, okay, room temperature. After about five days, it's tasting ridiculously pickly. You'd be surprised. After a week, it's probably great. You can carry on pickling for any length of time you like. But if you feel that now the pickle's got to the, just the right stage, you can slow it down just by putting it in the fridge. And uh, um, uh, on YouTube there are dozens of fantastic videos showing all the different methods, but our ancestors used fermentation to keep us alive in winter. Almost throughout the world, that's how your ancestors did it. They would have fermented all the things we like, like cheeses, uh, yogurts, they would have um, made pickles and preserves, they would have made beers and wines, and uh, they would have sun-dried or wind-dried hams, or whatever it was. So your, your gut is expecting bacteria, okay? Because our ancestors were so used to eating fermented foods, you know, at the end of the season, they're not going to throw away all the vegetables. They're going to pickle them and keep them and make sure that, you know, if we don't see vegetables again until the spring, that we're all going to survive. So suddenly, everything's changed. Suddenly, we're not getting all these pickled and preserved products. Even the cheese... You know, unless you're getting unpasteurized cheese, which is easy to get, all the supermarkets sell unpasteurized cheese, they have to label it, and lots of cheeses like Parmesan are always unpasteurized. Um, so the way to get these uh, bacteria back are to eat, to hopefully make, your, make at home fermented foods. It's no good going for a pickle that's been made in a factory because they, they will have pasteurized it so the jar doesn't explode on a hot day in the supermarket. So you've really got to do it yourself. But it's very simple. And you can pickle anything. You can pickle peppers. You can pickle anything you like. And they can look quite colorful in different jars. And you can play about. Um, but you can repair your gut. Uh, also, there are drinks that you can make. And my favorite is kefir, which is spelled K-E-F-I-R. And there are people on the internet who will either sell it to you for almost nothing or give it away because this stuff grows. You, um, uh, there are two types of kefir. There's milk kefir and there's water kefir. I prefer the water kefir. The milk kefir makes a type of yogurt, but I think yogurt tastes nicer. But the water kefir, you can use fruits, you can use sugar, and uh, I've had people who've admitted to me that they, they've said, oh, you know, I've, you know, I've had diarrhea every day for months and three days on kefir, completely fixed. You can repair your gut very easily. And um, kefir in Turkish means feel good. And right throughout Europe, they have different names for kefir. Um, and uh, uh, in some places, it's called uh, crystal fungus. You know, all the, it, it's very famous. Nobody knows how it, how, how it was first discovered, but it's been passed down from generation to generation. And if you've got the jar, a jar with it, um, each time you make it, it grows. It's, it's a mixture of bacteria and yeasts and so on, living in a symbiotic relationship. And you very soon have enough to give all your friends. It's fantastic. Uh, tastes quite nice. And um, oh, it only, it go, the fermentation process for kefir is so fast. So let's say uh, you dissolve some uh, sugar in water, you put in the kefir, it's like jelly-like. Leave it in the dark with the lid off. Within about three days, 
it's burnt up most of the sugar and uh, three, four days later it's tasting really nice, it's not, not really sweet anymore. Then on the fifth, sixth day it'll start turning to vinegar and the more vinegary it gets, actually the more therapeutic its effect is, but you can drink a litre of it a day. You start off small, uh, as I say, I'm interested in the stuff that costs nothing and um, kefir costs nothing to make and you know, ver fermented vegetables cost nothing to make. Um, super keys to health, absolute keys to health. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about the brain. Um, you know, we discussed earlier, you know, the brain, as you know, is made primarily of water. But the second ingredient, the dry weight of the brain, is cholesterol. 60% uh, of your brain is cholesterol. And so if any of you are still eating low-fat, low-cholesterol products, just stop right away. Um, you know, we used to know the definition of good things. They'd call it the cream, the cream of the crop. And 50 years ago, they started demonizing cream and saying cream is bad for you. But the cream is the best. It always has been. There are, there are, you know, there are only two things that rise to the top, are the cream and the scum. The problem is that the cream is in the place yet. <laughs> So, um, the first time I really had a, a real experience of this was a couple of years ago, I, was, I, I started giving talks about um, high, high cholesterol foods and how to give them to people. At that point, I was recommending that anybody with uh, Alzheimer's should be given six <coughs> tablespoonfuls of coconut oil every day. And, you know, you, you, if they're having porridge or something, you put it in the porridge, if they're having stew, they put it in the stew. You try and find any way you can. And uh, this woman came up to me, or, or rang me up, and said, well, my, my mother wouldn't take the six tablespoonfuls, but I did manage to give her most days four tablespoonfuls. And she said, two years ago, I'd given up talking to her on the phone because it was impossible, you know, the Alzheimer's got so bad. And she said, six weeks on four tablespoonfuls of coconut oil, and she could speak to her mum on the phone again. You know, she, she credited two years reversal in six weeks. So what other high cholesterol foods are there that are really good for you? Well, eggs. You know, egg yolks are the most brilliant brain food out. You know, if I knew somebody who had Alzheimer's, uh, I might suggest to them, well, why don't you eat 10 eggs a day? Okay, all this thing about eggs being bad for you, it's just like cholesterol being bad for you, you are made of cholesterol. Every cell in your body uh, has cholesterol in it. You can't survive without cholesterol. Without cholesterol, your brain, which should be, if you like, solid, starts looking like a sponge. But the good news is, to some degree, you can rebuild brains. And um, there's a great book by the guy who fixed me, Patrick Holford, called Optimal Nutrition for the Mind. And if you want to learn about how to boost your minds, uh, I would highly recommend it. Um, some, some incredible information there. And uh, so, so what are the things that, that you can get your brain back with? Um, could I, uh, could I ask, how, how many of you feel that from time to time you get brain fog? Mm. <laughs> okay, that's quite a few of us. Uh, me too. Um, I noticed when I started uh, supplementing with iodine that I had a different access to my brain. Whereas I used to um and er and try to think of words and they wouldn't come, iodine freed my brain up significantly. And many, many, many people, since I've been recommending iodine, have reported the same thing. Uh, now, iodine is something that you want to research personally before you start taking it. Because uh, while it is ludicrously safe, if you went to a doctor and said you were supplementing with iodine, the doctors these days are taught that the right amount to supplement with is in micrograms. But 80 years ago, um, you'll find that doctors were, in some cases, giving doses up to a gram. Um, now, a gram of iodine, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a gram of iodine is actually quite a lot. Now, um, uh, the people who have the lowest breast cancer in the world, supposedly, apart from the primitive tribes who pretty much have none, uh, of uh, the, the sort of developed world are the Japanese. Now, the Japanese eat, on average, 12 and a half milligrams of iodine every day in the form of seaweed. Now, they have the lowest breast cancer in the world. There is a link, a huge link, uh, between all the cancers that are to do with the sex organs 
and iodine because iodine is the basis for all your hormones. But if you're eating food that's been prepared with water with fluoride in, if you're bathing in water with chlorine in it, if you're being exposed to bromides, which are in a lot of processed foods, um, that those displace iodine. And so you need to get all, all the bad halogens out of your life. And just to, just to be clear about the bad halogens, you know, in World War I, if you wanted to kill a lot of people really cleanly, then chlorine was your gas of choice. It was hugely popular. You know, one gas of the year, several years. Um, now, in uh, World War II, um, fluoride was really popular because Hitler used it uh, in the concentration camps. You know, they wanted a colorless, odorless, um, tasteless liquid that they could just slip into the water supply. And fluoride was perfect for that. It makes people really docile do what you want, makes them compliant, just like bromine does and in the First World War to stop the men getting horny and to make them really compliant and go over the top and get shot back down again, they put brom bromide in the tea. And uh, we're being subjected to those three big time and it is super important to get them out. You know, at the very least you use a water filter. Um, if you've got a, one built in your plumbing, even better. But if you're going to fill a bath or have a shower, you need a filter there. Now again, if you've got the money, put, them, put in an online filter where the water comes into your house. If you don't, uh, not everybody's seen these, uh, you can buy shower heads with a sort of triple filter system in. And they cost about 15 quid. And they don't last forever. You've got to replace them every six, nine months or something <coughs> like that, depending on your water. But um, it makes a hell of a difference, and um, lots of people have s said to me, well, you know, not only does the bathroom smell a lot nicer now, but my hair's softer and skin better and, and so on. And it's very important. You really don't want those, those halogens in your body because all your hormones will, will be made out of them. You know, so there are lots of people in this room whose hormones are being partly made from fluoride, and um, you know, it explains a, a lot of issues. Um, one of the big issues it, it, it explains is the epidemic of hypothyroidism, low thyroid out there. Now, uh, it, it is epidemic, and the reason it's epidemic is because of the chlorine and the fluoride. Um, so it is vital that all of you know, know how to spot whether, whether you've got it, first of all. Let, let me go through a few symptoms, because I, I realized that, that, that I had it, and... Um, uh, it took me ages to wake up myself. What the, the, the symptoms can be, it's different for everybody, difficulty losing weight, cold hands and feet, poor t out of control body temperatures. Um, if you feel the, your elbow, your, your elbow should have uh, the same feel as the rest of your skin. If, if your elbow feels uh, sort of not smooth, then uh, that, that's a, a, a sign if you've got rough elbows. If you squeeze your skin, now on your lower arm you should virtually be able to touch thumb and forefinger together. Try on the top of your arm, you should be able to do the same. But if it feels very thick at the top of your arm, if you can pinch it together tightly, great. But if it's thick, that's called mucin. And that's this like sticky substance which builds up under the skin. Um, People who've got uh, sometimes bags under their eyes, people start to go puffy around the, around the neck. If any of you, and one of the symptoms that I always hated was I could never wear my shirt tight. I absolutely hated it. And it turns out that's a, that can be a symptom of thyroid problems because your thyroids are right here. And uh, uh, anyway, I bought a book called Hypothyroidism Type <coughs> 2 by Mark Starr. And I was not dead by this book because it described me absolutely. You know, I, I had every symptom going. It explained why I've been tired for the last 35 years. Mm. You know, I'm one of these people who, when I used to go to work every day, I'd fall asleep on the train, I'd fall asleep in the lunch break, I'd fall asleep on the train back. I was completely tired all the time. And that was adrenal exhaustion and uh, uh, thyroid issues. Now I realize that what I should have done is I should have taken iodine 
and I should have taken some desiccated thyroid. Now, the vegetarians and the vegans don't like this idea, but uh, traditionally, before thyroid medication, before, you know, before the patented stuff, the doctors, 80 years ago, would have given you iodine, and they would have given you a little bit of desiccated thyroid from an animal. And um, now, uh, I used to be able to buy desiccated thyroid. You could just buy it on the internet, but you can't anymore. They've banned it, just like they've banned melatonin, just like they've banned herbs, you know, uh, all the natural hormones you can't get anymore. Uh, but if you go to the doctor, you should be able to persuade them to give you a natural desiccated thyroid. They'll say, oh, no, but um, we've done the blood test and you're negative. Turns out that about 98% of the blood tests for, th for uh, thyroid are wrong. They don't work because the doctors don't recognize the real symptoms. And I, funny enough, I, went to, I changed doctors. And I went to see my doctor just last week, and I, I was talking to her about the thyroid test they're allowed to do. And the ones you want are to measure your free T3 and your reverse T3. And I said, can we get that on the NHS? Oh, no. No, you can't have those. And now that they're managing their own budgets, of course, you're going to be less likely than ever to get anything out of them. But while you still can get blood tests, I would recommend that uh, everybody should have their levels looked at. You know, how are you on, on energy? If you're low on energy, maybe you should have uh, your iron levels checked. Maybe you should have your B12 levels checked. Everybody should have their vitamin D levels checked. You know, the rate of cancer goes up in November. I think it's at its height in November when uh, people have and now have been absolutely sun-starved. You know, uh, people don't realize that if everybody took enough vitamin D, the chances are they probably wouldn't be able to hardly anything. The, the figures are outrageous. There have been studies done all over the world, and it shows very clearly that the cancer rate, let's say, from Norway, drops like a stone as you go down to Nigeria, because the more sun people are getting, the less cancer they get, the less heart attacks they get, the less depression they get. It's really about the sun. You know, we're meant to be out there walking barefoot in lots of sunshine. And it was only a few generations ago that most of our people would have been farmers. And we would have all been getting loads of sun, and now it's demonized. And the darker your skin color, the more you need that sun. And so in winter, I would say everybody is deficient on, in vitamin D, unless you're really out in the sun a lot. But even probably if you were naked in December, you wouldn't get enough sun. Um, the doctor that I was mentioning earlier, I was around his house a few years ago and he was saying how awful he was with the flu and I gave him 50,000 units of vitamin D. Now the RDA at that point I think was 200 units, I think now they've put it up to 400 units. I gave him 50,000. Three hours later he said, you know, I'm feeling a lot better. Now um, I'm not saying that that always happens. but. Uh, it, the odd thing, it was, it was this doctor 10 years ago who put me onto vitamin D, and when I started taking vitamin D, I've never had a cold or flu since. Now, um, if you really want protection, vitamin D is a really good starting point, and there's no way to know who needs vitamin D and who doesn't and how much. The only way to tell actually is with a test. Um, I used to think that, that you could overdose on vitamin D, but it does appear now to be very, very, very rare. And so I take 50,000 international units uh, once a week. I'm thinking of upping that to 100,000 once a week. Now, the international units thing is interesting. You know, in the old days, they used to give lots and lots of vitamin D. And um, uh, they would often give amounts like 20 milligrams of the I don't want to confuse you. They used to use another type. They used to use another type of D2, and they used to give 20 milligrams. Now, if you convert 20 milligrams into international units, that's one million units. Now, um, they deliberately, as far as I can work out, changed the system of measurements for vitamin D and a few others, the vitamins, from milligrams to international units. Because 20 milligrams doesn't sound like much, but a million international units sounds like a hell of a lot. Um, because obviously they want you to have lower and lower amounts. That's why they're trying currently to, to, to regulate vitamins and minerals, which you know, clearly we're not going to allow them to tamper with. Uh, I recommend everybody should be growing all their own uh, food, herbs uh, at home. 
because our ancestors kept us alive on herbs. Um, you know, they didn't burn the witches for no reason, they knew a thing or two. And all that information is still available. You know, strangely enough, Culpepper's, you know, the classic English herbal, is still as relevant today as ever. But um, recently, while well, I've always been very, very keen on herbs, I'd always sort of slightly dismissed essential oils. And just recently, I've been forced to discover how incredible essential oils are and how powerful they are. In fact, it seems now, from the research I've been doing, that, let's say, a herb is one times power, that an essential oil of that same herb could be 100,000 times that power. And it's this supercharging of products that I really like. Let me give you another example of how to supercharge a product. Let's say you've got a lentil. Okay, let's say you've got a bag of lentils. Now, I always think that lentils are pretty boring. Very occasionally somebody will cook me something nice with lentils, uh, but I'm always surprised when they do. And, um, but I know they're healthy, and I'll eat them because they're healthy. However, let's say you soak those lentils in water for half a day or a day, and now you, you strain it off, leave it for another half a day, rinse it, strain it off, leave it another half a day, keep doing that for two or three days, and now you've got sprouting lentils. Now, Whereas the lentil was totally inedible before, if you sprouted it for a few days, you can just eat it as salad and it's very nice. But you've, you've upped the nutritional factor substantially. It's not like you've doubled it or factor of 10. You might have whacked it up by 5,000 times, conceivably, depending on which mineral and vitamin you're talking about, because you've brought it alive. You know, that, that dead lentil, the dormant lentil, okay, it's healthy. But a live sprouting thing can crack concrete on motorways. You know, you really are supercharging with, spr with sprouted foods. Some of the, the healthiest of the uh, foods, let's say you wanted some foods that are anti-cancer, you want to be really healthy, um, broccoli, all the brassicas are brilliantly anti-cancer, right? as, as in all, are all the onion, garlic, leek families. But you can sprout those. You can take broccoli seeds, for instance, and sprout them. It takes a few days. Uh, you can take seeds of all your favorite salad vegetables, from radishes to garlic chives to onions to celery to everything. You can sprout everything. You can have a massive salad from sprouts. Now, this is really important to realize that, you know, let's say you're on the 35th floor of a tower block and you want fresh salad every day, summer, summer winter, well, sp sprout, sprout them. I bought some uh, seeds the other day uh, well, the other day, about a year ago, I think I spent 20 quid on a whole variety of seeds, and I reckon they're going to last me about five years because I'm constantly uh, growing. Every, you know, I've got always two lots of salad going going on seeds, so I've got some that are ready now, and some are going to be ready in three or four days, and uh, it costs nothing. I make fresh salads in the middle of the winter in my kitchen, and it's costing me a couple of pennies. Uh, and I really recommend that everybody gets into doing some sprouting. Um, it saves a fortune, very, very healthy, and, you know, occasionally somebody says, oh, I've got a granny who's a hundred, and she, 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 you know, I want to give her salad, because I know it's good for her, but she won't eat it. Okay, if you can juice the sprouts, uh, you can turn it from something that granny would never eat into a little glass of, glass of something she might drink. Um, it's, it's important to know how to get people back, back from a serious situation. And there are several serious situations that are worth knowing about. I, I, I haven't done it anymore, but I used to carry around cayenne pepper at all times, hoping that somebody would drop down dead of a heart attack. And they never did, and I was really quite upset with it. Uh, <laughs> the thing is that there are loads of doctors out there, you can look this up, up on the web, who are saying, well, rather than wait for the defibrillator, or we, we tried to get them back, but we couldn't. Uh, but, so we've got some cayenne pepper, or, or any, any super hot chilies, get a couple of teaspoonfuls, dissolve it in some warm water, sit them up, open their throat, chuck it in. They're not going to care, they're dead. But they do care because when they come back to life, they're really angry because <laughs> you set fire to them. It's the same as you know, giving them a huge electric shock but from the inside out. And you'd be surprised, on the internet, it would appear that 99% of them are coming back to life. Um, so there are other things you can do. I mean, uh, this one would take some quick thinking. But let's say that somebody had a heart attack, but now their heart isn't beating. They're still alive, and they've got, what, I don't know, 10, 20 seconds or something. What they do is they cough, and you can cough your way to the emergency room. Each cough gives you a heartbeat. 
So if somebody, literally their heart stops beating, you tell them to cough their way until they get resuscitated. Um, I'm only the messenger. <laughs> um, okay, let me go back to ID and tell you a little bit how, how, to, how to look at that. Now, um, you want to paint iodine on rather than drink it. If you've got a stomach upset, uh, you might want to you always dilute it in water if you're going to drink it. Um, it's antiviral, antifungal, and antibacterial, so iodine can be very powerful, but of course they do, you can't have, get iodine in the chemist anymore, they've banned that. Um, uh, however, you can buy it, luckily, uh, in actually better form than they sold in the chemists. And there are a couple of good forms. The form that I like is this one. It's called Lugol's iodine. This is a mixture of iodine and potassium iodide, which is what they give the soldiers when they're going to be exposed to nuclear war. And because there is um, nuclear debris in the air right now, and one of the dangerous ones is radioactive iodine, if you take iodine, then if, if, your, if all the cells of your body are replete, are full of iodine, the radioactive iodine will not go in you. It literally bounces off. People don't realize that if you want to be um, uh, as safe as one can be from radiation, this is not going to protect you from plutonium, some of the real nasties, if you have full nutrition, if all the receptor sites for all the nutrients you need are full, uh, you're in a far safer position. So. Iodine is, is, is sort of number one. It's what they gave uh, people after Chernobyl. Uh, they gave them zeolite, iodine. So what you want to do with iodine is ideally to paint it on. And I paint it on my skin. Um, if you want to take a dose that was the same as the 12 and a half milligrams that the Japanese women take, that would be two drops. Uh, this is 12, 12 and a half percent. Two, two drops would be a maintenance dose of iodine. That's if you're drinking it with water. But if you're putting it on the skin, you need to multiply that by about 8. So the maintenance drop will be about 16 drops rubbed into the skin. Um, although it's not an infallible test, if you think you're low on iodine, it doesn't, it's, I say it's not infallible, but if you paint some on the skin, it should be there many hours later. But if you're really low, it seems that the, the skin just sucks it in really fast. And when I first discovered this, I found that within, a, within an hour, uh, pretty much all the iodine had gone, and now I put it on, it takes, takes know, eight hours or something uh, to go. So uh, you can build up your levels. Uh, now, it's important to understand that, let's say a woman gives birth to a child and, and the, the mother was low on iodine, the, the kid will be born with a low IQ. And if, you, if you're very low on iodine, there's a medical term for it, it's called cretinism, and the child's born a cretin, they're mentally defective. So iodine is about IQ, that's why I said it lifts brain fog. It gives you access to your brain properly, and many people notice it. But iodine is far more than that. It means your hormones can work properly. You know, iodine is, is super, super important, and everybody needs it, particularly children. Uh, the, the British government did a test recently on teenage girls. They found, I think, that 48% or something uh, uh, were already showing uh, signs of being low iodine. And that means that, um, you know, the problems, problems with low iodine are really serious. You know, birth defects, you know, uh, hypothyroidism, so many serious problems. And I recommend that all of you read up on iodine. On my website, we've written a big article about iodine. And uh, it's so important. Everybody needs to know um, because it really is a, a lifesaver. Let me tell you about some of the other lifesavers and how to use them. Oh, just before I finish on iodine. Um, <coughs> It would be very important not to take too much iodine. So uh, most people who are low on iodine, how you tell is to take a temperature, okay? And your, let's say your normal temperature should be something like 98.4. People argue about the number, 98.6, 98.4. But let's say it was uh, 97.6, just one degree lower, okay? Uh, that, they say, reduces your immune uh, system by 40%. So if your temperature is one degree low, your immune system is compromised 40%. Two degrees low, you're running, running really cold temperature, you're supposed to be compromised 80%. So what you want to do, when you wake up in the morning, throw the covers off and wait a couple of minutes before you get up. Take your temperature then, after the heat of the duvet or whatever has just gone off, the, 
going to try and take your real temperature. If you've got a temperature that goes behind the ears, that's great. If you've got a mercury thermometer, that's great. If you've got an alcohol thermometer, they work pretty well. If you've got a digital thermometer, they're not so accurate, take the test several times. Possibly under the arm might be a good place. If you're one degree low, you need to consider, are you hypothyroid? And when you start realizing what the problems of being hypothyroid actually are, uh, and they appear to include heart attacks, all sorts of bizarre things you, that you wouldn't have thought, uh, it appears that looking after your thyroid is much more important than you would have thought. And there are two ways to do it. One is with the desiccated thyroid. The other is with the iodine. You really need both. But iodine uh, is certainly something that everybody should consider. And I, I would suggest that 95% of you, of us, are, are uh, deficient in iodine because of our exposure to, to bath water. That's just one example. Um, another really important one, which we uh, mentioned earlier, is the magnesium. Now, there are many types of magnesium. Uh, if you go into Holland and Barrett and you buy their magnesium, uh, you'll find that that's usually magnesium oxide. Now, all the magnesiums are great if you want to move the bowels, and magnesium oxide would do that really well. But if you want to get magnesium into you on a cellular level, Take it internally, you can only take so much and, and so it does move the bowels. But if you spray it on, on your skin, it, it doesn't have an effect on the bowels and you can take much, 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 much more. And remember, that the reason that people used to go and take the waters, you know, they'd go to the spas and the bars, often was to bathe in magnesium. And, you know, Epsom salt baths, you know, um, magnesium is such a, a relaxant. And uh, let me tell you some inter interesting thing about cancer. In 1931, some very interesting things happened. Um, as I heard somebody speaking er earlier, uh, Otto Warburg won the Nobel Prize for his work proving that if a cell is deprived of oxygen, that uh, to survive, it starts burning glucose instead and becomes cancerous. The same year, 1931. So why I say that is, if, any, if the doctors say we don't know the cause of cancer, well, where were they in 1931? Why aren't they teaching it now? Also in 1931, the French Cancer Society had a pre uh, presentation by this doctor who'd been working in Egypt for 30 years, and he explained that Egyptians only got a tenth of the cancer rate of Europeans. But if you took an Egyptian to Europe, within two years they got the same cancer rate as Europeans. So what was it? It wasn't the fact they were Egyptian, it was something about the food. And after 30 years, he'd worked it out, it was the magnesium. There was lots of magnesium in all the food in Egypt because they weren't at that by that time they weren't still using the they weren't using the modern fertilizers that the whole of Europe were using because the modern fertilizers were stripping the magnesium out of the soil so the plants were growing without magnesium, hence the huge cancer rate. Mm. So is magnesium important? Uh, it's important for heart attacks to, to stop them, it's important to stop strokes, it's important to stop cancer. Mm. It's important for everything actually. It, it makes uh, DHEA, which is the most commonly occurring um, hormone in your body. DHEA allows you to be happy. It allows you to make testosterone. Magnesium is super important, and everybody should be, should be using it. What I would recommend, or how I use it, is after a shower, uh, I just rub it on. Spray as much as you like. You, there is no such thing as really too much. And uh, some people have said, do you know, I had the best night's sleep ever. Um, a lot of people's anxiety, nervousness goes. Um, it, it's nice. You know, people notice iodine, they notice magnesium. And if anybody's getting a muscle cr a cramp, let's say it might take a while normally for that to pass, spray some magnesium straight on the muscle cramp and rub it in. It'll stop in a fraction of the time. Um, another important one uh, are the minerals. The, the, these are called fulvic minerals. And these are super important. You know, if you go into uh, a supermarket or something, or, or even a good health food store sometimes, to buy your minerals, they, they tend to be metallic minerals, inorganic minerals. But we want or organic minerals. Now, what is an organic mineral? It's one that's made from a plant. Right? Now, um, you've seen animals on wildlife programs go mental about They'll, they'll travel hundreds of miles to lick rocks. You know, they'll, they search out minerals. You've probably seen that, you know, where the animals go to, to places where they can lick the minerals. 
you know, farmers don't put animals in a field without a salt lick. You know, they're aware that you have to give a balance of minerals to, to animals, uh, otherwise they don't work right. So uh, traditionally, we, we would have got that from salt, which is why salt's so expensive. Just, just to clarify on salt, you know, the word salary comes from the word sal, salt, because the Roman le legions were paid in salt. It was considered you know, more important to pay them in salt. If you weren't worth your salt, you died. You know, without salt, uh, we don't do well. And there's no, it's no surprise that people aren't doing so well health-wise just because they haven't got salt. So, but salt are, is the inorganic minerals. Uh, it's great, but you can, do, you, can, you can take the organic minerals in this form. Now, uh, the contents of this bottle are about a million years old. Uh, possibly, sorry. The contents of this bottle are about 100 million years old. Uh, people ask me, should I keep it in the fridge? No, you don't need to bother. Is there a, do I have to use it quickly? No. Um, uh, so, where do they come from? They come from one of these special places that uh, they knew about it because the animals used to go there. Um, when, you, when you see, it, it's from soil, and when you see the soil, there are lots of tiny little sparkly, crystally things in it. It's hugely mineral-rich soil, and all they do is they dig it up, they get spring water and they soak the soil in spring water for three years. Then they drain it off. And it comes out so concentrated as a mineral soup, if you like, there's enough in here for four months. So I started reading about fulvic minerals a few years ago. The Chinese are really into it. And they'll have baths and stuff. They, they, they really go for it. And I started reading these stories about fulvic minerals, which just sounded impossible. You know, all these people curing themselves of all sorts of things. And so I started sending off for it. And bottles used to arrive, Gen generally big bottles, some a little bit smaller than that used to arrive. And I'd try each one as it arrived, and I'd never feel anything. And then one day, this little bottle arrived, and I woke up the next morning and I felt different. And, and I really, you know, it takes a lot to make me feel different. You know, some people are really sensitive. I'm not. I need six, six or other people might have one, so to speak. But I noticed the difference. I thought, wow. And after a couple of weeks, it was really clear my body felt so much nicer to be in. It was as though 10 or 20 years had just dropped off me. And I felt great. And I started giving it to everybody I know. And a surprising number of people get a good reaction. Really surprising. And then people who've been on it for a few years have other things to say. Some people say, um, oh, you know, I was, my hair was thinning and, and I got double the thickness of hair I used to have. It's, it's not everybody gets that one. Um, I've had other people, you might not get that result. Um, uh, I've had other people say things like, you know, that fibromyalgia I've had for 10 years, it's gone. And I'm not saying this is the cure for fibromyalgia, but the thing is, it's, it's completely obvious that all you need is to be low on one mineral and your whole body can break. Right? So for a lot of people, they've been chronically low on one or more minerals maybe their whole lives. Maybe they just haven't liked beetroot, and they've ignored a whole class of foods, and they've got a deficiency going on. So, okay. Um, so, there are basically about a hundred things you need uh, to eat to be really healthy, and about 70 of them are in here. All the trace minerals, the tiny elements, and it's the trace minerals they now believe are one of the big components of longevity, and uh, this is the stuff that cleans the cells. This is the stuff I added to the tea bag. Uh, you put seven drops in, in a glass of water, a big glass of water, and it's got to be free of chlorine and free of fluoride, okay? The stuff reacts badly with halogens. So assuming you're filtering your water, you're all right. But I'd recommend everybody take seven drops of this a day um, and see if you notice the difference. Uh, uh, it's the missing ingredient. This is, this, is what's, this is a big part of what's missing from food. Right, um, the trace minerals, super important. Let me, because we're in a bit of a rush now, let me go through some of the other super important things. Vitamin D, it's cheap as chips, ludicrously cheap. Um, I mentioned about uh, the cells of our body having an electrical charge. How can you tell what the electrical charge is of your body at any time? Well, one good way is to take your pH and uh, pH strips are really easy. Uh, you want to be, um, roughly speaking, 6.5 or over. And 
uh, your pH makes a complete difference to your ability to heal. If you're, let me give you an example, 500 uh, newly diagnosed cancer clients, cancer patients, the day they tested them, about 460 were running an acid body when we should be running an alkaline body. So you want to make sure that you're healthy, test your pH, find out, because you can't heal it with an acid pH. If you have got an acid pH, how, how can you correct it? Well, one sort of get out of jail free card is to use bicarbonate of soda. Two hours after a meal, take half a teaspoonful of bicarbonate, a glass of water. If you've just eaten a very acidic meal, let's say lots of meat and carbs, bicarb is, is going to help uh, realkalize you. Uh, fulvic minerals actually realkalize you. Um, I also recommend a really high quality multi mineral that's got the zinc and the chromium. You know, anybody who's um, craving sugar and chocolate, usually that's a chromium deficiency, screaming out chromium deficiency. Um, this has got the manganese. You, you buy this from uh, a bad supermarket and they put synthetic minerals, and, sorry, synthetic vitamins in these days, and the synthetic vitamins are, are poisonous, you know, to put it blank, frankly. Uh, you want a high quality multi, no, it would be better to take nothing than take some of the ones that are being touted yeah, if it costs four ninety nine, run a mile. Um, okay, there are a few other things I can show you. Uh, um, in here uh, is uh, some what we call silver argan gel. The most important of the ingredients in here is silver. Um, could I just ask you how many of you know about or have used colloidal silver? Brilliant. That's almost all of you. That's fantastic. Um, how many of you have got a colloidal silver generator at home? Well, that's pretty good too. You're switched on, you guys. Um, if any of you uh, don't know about colloidal silver, find out. There's lots of people you can ask. Uh, to get a good colloidal silver generator, um, about 160 quid for one that turns itself off. And that's the important thing. You want one that turns itself off, which means it can measure how many parts per million of silver. Um, I've seen people uh, who have been really told they're going to die of MRSA, you know, that, that lovely flesh-eating disease you pick up in hospitals. I've, I've seen pe people completely get a clean bill of health in three weeks uh, with, with using colloidal silver and, and a few bits of nutrition. Super, super, super important. Um, another thing that's quite interesting is uh, there are now quite inexpensive DNA tests you can get done. So anybody who can't figure out why they still can't get well. They've, they've done all the things they've been told to do and they can't figure it out. DNA tests can be absolutely brilliant, as can hair mineral analysis tests. Um, and if anybody needs that stuff, they can get in touch with me and I can uh, explain it. Um, this is a frequency device. Uh, this is um, a Russian device developed by the Russian space industry in the sort of 80s are now up, upgraded. You know, when they put uh, the cosmonauts up there, you know, the Russians had no money compared to the Americans. You know, the, the Americans, for instance, spent 20 million developing uh, a ball, ballpoint pen that would write in space. You know, the Russians didn't have that much money, so they took pencils. <laughs> they, uh, similarly, they had no room or weight to put um, medicines in, and they didn't know what, was, what they might get ill with. So they, they designed this, which not only fixes uh, disease and so on, but it actually puts electrons in and stops you getting diseases in the first place. Um, they are reversing blindness now. And this is one of the things that can reverse blindness. There are several uh, very interesting things that are happening. Uh, and it's worth understanding that there are several people reversing blindness in the world. If you want to know more about that, I'd recommend you, you check out a radio program uh, by a guy called Edward Kondrot, K-O-N-D-R-O-T, um, using ozone, using frequency devices, using uh, essential oils. There are a number, number of ways to do it. For my, for my eyes, I take uh, high-dose vitamin C, astaxanthin, uh, bilberry tincture, which is, I make myself, which tastes, tastes delicious. I recommend you all make it. Um, I make uh, a... Um, marigold tea for the lutein um, and I take everything we've just mentioned 
and uh, I saw my vision uh, improve two lines on the chart. I can now read, read the bottom line, uh, which I haven't been able to do since I was in my 20s. Um, so it's worth understanding that you can reverse eyesight uh, issues. And another, another way to, you know, different techniques for different, um, uh, different conditions, but for just long and short sight, for a tenor, you can buy pinhole glasses. And uh, I put these on, on my website, and about two months later, I got a call from somebody that says, God, they really work. It only took me three weeks, and I was noticing the difference. And uh, since then, lots of people uh, say, say how, how good they found them. You, you just wear them 15 minutes a day, and so you might want to read with them. You might want to look in the distance with them. And it takes a bit of effort. When you look, if your distance vision is poor, it takes a bit of effort to look through them and focus, but suddenly you remember what it's like. So you, you don't need glasses when, when you're using these, uh, but you want to use, use them in good, good light, 15 minutes a day, and you can strengthen your eye muscles. Uh, cheap and works. Um, uh, to uh, tell you where, where my research is taking me at the moment, uh, which is towards essential oils, um, I th it's very important if you're working with essential oils to understand that there's a big difference between therapeutic oils, which are real, and the ones they sell in health food sh stores. Uh, in America, for instance, um, uh, you can have an essential oil which says 100% pure. Now, according to the FDA in America, so long as there's 5% ingredients in there, you're allowed to call it 100% pure. And I haven't had t time to look into the English regulations, but they may well be the same. So be very careful because essential oils can be hugely dangerous if they've been made as a fragrance type oil. Very different to put on the skin, so watch out. But what, I, what I'm now discovering is that essential oils can do uh, the most incredible job at healing, very inexpensively, and it's about frequency. You know, the, the, this Russian device puts frequency into the body, but you can do the same with essential oils. And um, uh, I've used frequency devices, and I've seen people who've been in pain for 40 years come out of pain. Um, it's uh, surprising, and the evidence is there. Um, this particular one is called Scanar, um, and the company that I deal with uh, is a company called Pain Genie. And I'd recommend that you uh, ha have, a, have a look at uh, the product, because it's super powerful. And there's masses on YouTube about it. Um, now, uh, a bit of advertising. I have a website uh, which is called ancientpurity.com, and I can give you all a piece of paper with, with the details. And basically, I've tried to get together uh, supplements and useful tools that really work and that are at the best price, um, because I, I reckon that 95% plus of all the supplements out there uh, are just not going to do what you want. Uh, it's, most of the companies out there are getting taken over. A lot of the traditional health food companies are being bought out. They're changing their formulas. They're not as strong as they were. But it's down to the quality of the ingredients. And um, you know, my father used to have a sort of has a, a poster on his wall which, which says, uh, "My taste is simple. Uh, I just like the best." And actually, the best lasts the longest, and it's worth going for. Now. Um, uh, we've also put a massive information on the website because I believe that all the, this information ought to be free and it's about empowering ourselves. We all need to get a grasp of actually how simple it is. You know, People need to know that their brain's made of cholesterol. You need to tell everybody you meet because uh, there, are, there are people drop, dropping like flies out there for lack of salt, lack of a few essential things like, like knowing what to eat. Watch out, by the way, for bread. Okay. They've changed bread entirely. It's not 100% whole wheat like you might think. Almost every bread now is 43% soya if it comes in a packet. Be very careful. Soya is an endocrine disruptor. Mm. Think of the most famous person who used to tout soya as a health food product. That was Linda McCartney, mm. possibly. Uh, did she live to a ripe old age? I think she died of breast cancer, and unfortunately, uh, she probably ate the product because soya products are an estrogen mimic. Um, soya milk, for example, used to be thrown away as a byproduct of the tofu <coughs> manufacturing industry. And uh, 
it is very unwise to eat unrefined uh, soya. So you don't want to eat soya sausages, you don't want to eat TVP protein, you don't want to eat soya, you want to avoid it like the plague unless it's been treated in advance <coughs> uh, like, like the old cultures used to do by fermenting it, soy sauce, that sort of thing. The other foods to avoid are any type of margarine, even the best ones, they're all, all poisonous, no animal would eat margarine. Uh, you, you, can, you can fill a room full of starving rats with margarine, they don't recognize it as food, they'll starve to death before they eat it. Um, and most of the oils, uh, unless it says cold pressed, uh, any oils are going to be very dangerous. That, that, that means all Chinese restaurants, all Indian restaurants, the oils that they're using, fish and chip shops, unless they're using lard, which apparently they do here, uh, the, uh, you want to be really careful because those oils are, are giving people heart attacks. Uh, they're messing people's brains up. So, um, uh, But all the information is there. And uh, I recommend a website, by the way, called earthclinic.com. There's another one called doctoryourself.com. Very powerful websites for information. Um, and, uh, uh, well, I think I'd probably better stop now. <laughs> it's anything to do, I'm sorry about my, I've got a grade 3 in integrated science because I've no idea how all of this works. So. Well, I've I got O-level woodwork, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, that's a new one on me, actually. Uh, uh, I know several people who, who can't wear watches because they stop on them. Have you tried sleeping grounded? Um, the you can, there are a number of ways to do it. The cheapest way is to get a little bit of wire and stick a, <coughs> stick a thing of metal into the, into, the, into the ground outside and run the bit of wire up to your bedroom. And um, uh, you can then buy, you can get, get little, little Velcro straps. That they use them in the computer business because uh, if you're mending microchips, uh, you don't want a static charge like a, you know, hitting the microchips, you can wipe out the microchips. They sell the, these, these little Velcro straps, they're called grounding straps. And so you connect yourself to the ground, literally. Or you can connect yourself to the earth socket of a three-pin plug. Then, uh, you, if, you, if you sleep with, with, with that on, you're now collect, connected to the ground. So all, that, all the electrical charges are, if you like, just being grounded out through you. So that might do it. If you've got enough money, you can buy a grounding sheet. They sell sheets with silver thread woven into it. You, um, some people notice, notice a huge difference. But have, do you turn your Wi-Fi off at night? No. Do that. Turn everything off. Anything wireless, phones, Wi-Fi, turn them off at night. Uh, see, see. I, I, I do. I, I, you know, there's no point in, in having Wi-Fi going through if you don't need it. Um, where, where can you learn, like, Oh, yes. Um, uh, I don't know if I've got, got time to, to run that through. Is it 10 minutes? Or, or, I haven't or got 10 minutes going, I'm sorry. But, um, uh, there's a book by Richard Bandler called Get the Life You Want. It costs about fiver, and I think the technique is in there. Uh, Richard Bandler uh, is you know, the father of NLP. And that book actually gives away, gives away most of the secrets that people pay thousands of pounds for to go on his courses. You? Yes? You were talking about uh, soya earlier. Uh, obviously, I've realised about soya now. Poor old soya now, for pounds sake, and then I've got to do it. But I'm, I'm interested in that corn. If you're a vegetarian, obviously, you're looking for some sort of uh, extra protein content or whatever you need to replace meat. I was interested in corn as well, and I went on Google trying to try to find it. 
I'm trying to find what it is and, and how and why and is it safe. And I couldn't find anything. I didn't, didn't spend that much time, but I, actually I couldn't find the information I was looking for. I'd like to be able to answer that question. I don't know. Yeah, it is, but, but, but how and is it good? And have they tested it? And I mean, who knows? It's been around for a long time. It's similar, but different. Kefir's, kefir, I think, tastes nicer, but they're both great. Yes. Um, well, there are so many of them. The first one I used uh, was a much bigger one, and I still have that. Um, and uh, if you, I have a website called theteslapro.com, and um, one of the machines is on there. Unfortunately, you know, legally, we're not allowed to say all the millions of things it can actually do. Is it it's like the Bob Beck device or the RSG? Mm. No, 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 no. It's 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 a, it's, it's really Tesla technology. It, it's an RF frequency generator, and it, uh, this one puts out a frequency of about four hundred and fifty thousand hertz. And um, uh, it, it well, I, I've 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 seen miracles happen. I, I'll tell you afterwards. What's your thoughts on uh, urine therapy? Well, uh, clearly it works. Yeah, yeah. It works. People are getting sat back in that water testimony. And uh, 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 allegedly Dave, who, who you, you may have come across, he, he was saying that when he was 16 or something he could do a full lotus, and at 40 he couldn't come anywhere close to it. And after three weeks or something on the urine therapy, every single one of his problems went away, and he could do the full lotus again. Uh, all, all the stuff that was stopping him being fully flexible. I think 28 days or something. Thank you very much. Cheers.